We are in uh, lecture 3 of uh, CS7015 and today we are going to cover the following modules. We are going to talk about sigmoid neurons, gradient descent, feed forward neural networks, representation power of feed forward neural network. So, let us uh, start. So, here are some acknowledgements. Uh, so, for one of the modules I have borrowed ideas from the videos of Ryan Harris on visualized back propagation. They are available on YouTube. You can have a look if you want. For module 3.5, I have borrowed ideas from this excellent book which is available online. It is uh, the URL is mentioned in the footnote and I am sure I would have been influenced and borrowed ideas from other places and I apologize if I am not acknowledged them properly. Properly, If you think there are some other sources from which I have taken ideas then let me know, I will put them in the acknowledgements. Okay. So, with that uh, we will start with module 3.1 which is on uh, sigmoid neurons. So, the story ahead is that it is enough about Boolean functions, right. Now, we have done a lot of Boolean functions, but now we want to move on to arbitrary functions of the form y is equal to f of x, where x could belong to r n and y could belong to r, right. So, what do I mean by this? Right? So, let me just uh, explain this with the help of an example. So, I again go back to our oil mining example, oil drilling example, where we are given a particular location. Uh, say in the ocean and we are interested in finding how much oil could I drill from this place and that is what I would base my decision on right whether I want to actually invest in this location or not. And then what we are saying is that this could depend on several factors. So, we could have x 1, x 2, x 3 up to x n right where this could be the salinity of the water at that location. So, this could be a real number this could be the density of the water right. So, average density this could be the pressure on the surface of the ocean bed and so on and so forth right. So, each of these values independently belongs to the set of real numbers right. So, each of this is a real number and we have n of these. So, together they belong to r n right. So, I can say that I have n such real numbers and I could just put them in a vector and say that I have a input x which belongs to r raised to n. Okay. So, we have this x which we can say belongs to r n and in this particular case we want to predict y, we want to take this as an input and predict a y right and what is y in this case? We want to predict the quantity of oil that we could mine right. So, what does r uh, y belong to? again a set of real numbers right. It could be some uh, gallons or liters or kil of, of water right. So, this again belongs to R. So, these are the kind of functions that we are interested in now. We want a function which takes us from uh, okay, I am having this x which belongs to R n right. It is a vector of dimension n and takes us to a value belonging to R right. So, you clearly see that this is different from the case when we had n variables each of which was just boolean right. So, these were only 0 1 inputs now we have real inputs and these are the kind of functions that we are interested in. Now, can we have a network which can represent such functions? Now, what do I mean by represent such functions? We already spoke about this when we were doing boolean functions ok. So, what do we mean by representing the function? We mean that if I am given a lot of training data right. So, I am given these x 1 x 2 each of these belongs to r n right and I am also given the corresponding labels. Now, I want a network which should be able to give me the same predictions as is are there in my training data. So, it should be able to take any of these x i s as input and it should give me the same y i corresponding to it and I am saying approximately which means I am ok with some error right within if it is uh, within some uh, with as long as it is close to the actual value I am fine with it. So, that is what I mean by a network which can represent such functions. Is that working definition of represent clear right. So, that is a very similar to the definition that we had used for boolean functions right. We had said that we should be exactly be able to get the truth table uh, the function the network should be able to represent the truth table exactly. So, that is very similar to the definition that I am using here ok. And then uh, before we do this right before we come up with a network which can do this for arbitrary functions we have to graduate from perceptrons to something known as sigma neurons. So, please remember this overall con context that we dealt with a lot of boolean functions. 
we analyzed them carefully and we saw that we could come up with these networks which could represent arbitrary boolean functions right and they could represent them exactly as long as we have one hidden layer of course the catch was that that hidden layer could grow exponentially now we want to graduate from boolean to real functions that means you have a real input of n variables and uh, one or more outputs and you should be able to represent this exactly right? so that's where the transition is so that's the story that we are looking for okay so let's start so recall that a perceptron will fire if the weighted sum of its inputs is greater than the threshold right just recall that fine so now i claim that the thresholding logic which is used by a perceptron is actually very harsh now what do i mean by that let's see so let us return to a problem of deciding whether we like or dislike a movie right that's the same problem that we have been dealing with and now consider that we base our decisions only on one input which is the critics rating which lies between 0 to 1 okay and this is what my uh, model looks like it takes the input as the critics rating i have learned some weight for it and my threshold is 0.5 okay what does this mean it means that if for a given movie the rating is 0.51 will it predict like or dislike like so then i should go and watch the movie what about a movie for which the critics rating is 0.49 dislike so now you see what i mean by harsh right so both these values are very close to each other but for one i say i like it for the other i say that i won't like it right so it's not how we make decisions right you would have probably said something equal for both the movies right you would have not given such a drastic decision so why is this happening so you might say oh this is a prob characteristic of a problem that you have picked up maybe that's the critics rating which is between 0 to 1 or something but i want to convince you that this is not a characteristic of the problem that i have picked up but this is something to do with the perceptron function itself so this is what the perceptron function looks like right so this sum of all the inputs the weighted sum of all the inputs i'm calling it by a quantity z right and this is what i'm going to plot on the this axis so this is my z axis okay now what does a perceptron say that when this value of z becomes greater than w not or minus of w not it will fire and when it's less than minus of w not it will not fire right that's what it says so this is a characteristic of the perceptron function itself it is going to have this sharp decision boundary that whenever your sum crosses this threshold you will say 1 and whenever your sum does not cross this threshold you will say 0 So in this toy example over the movie critics, it just happened that this was 0.5, and so it was saying yes for 0.51, and it was saying no for 0.49. Right? So this will happen for any problem that you pick up. Okay. So to counter this, we introduce something known as sigmoid neurons. Okay. And this is just a smoother function or a smoother version of the step function. You see that? Okay. How many of you know what? a sigmoid function what's the formula for a sigmoid function quite a few okay good and here is one such sigmoid function which is called the logistic function so remember that sigmoid is a family of functions these are functions which have this s shaped logistic function which i have shown here is one such function and the other function that we will see in this course is something known as the tan h function right so let me just uh, get into a bit more detail with this logistic function i just want you to understand it properly so this this quantity here remember we were writing it as w transpose x right which was summation i equal to 0 to n w i x i remember this right so now i'm just going to consider this to be 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w transpose x now i'm going to ask you some questions and try answering those what happens when w transpose x tends to infinity what happens to the sigmoid function 1 and that's exactly what is happening here as this tends to infinity as this keeps growing right so remember this axis is z which is the same as w transpose x right this is w transpose x okay so as it tends to infinity your sigmoid goes to 1 what happens if w transpose x is minus infinity zero and that's exactly what is happening here right and what happens when w transpose x is equal to zero half 
right. So, this is that value corresponding to half is that clear ok. So, that is how a sigmoid function behaves fine. Now, we no longer see a sharp transition it is a very smooth function and the sigmoid function lies between the values produced by the sigmoid function right. What is the range that they lie between 0 to 1. What is another quantity of interest that you know which lies between 0 to 1 probability. So, that is one advantage of sigmoid functions. So, now you can interpret the value given by a sigmoid function as a probability right. So, what does it mean in our movie example again? So, it just tells me in those two cases that with 51 percent probability I like the movie or with 49 percent probability I like the movie. So, now this is not very drastic or very harsh right I am not saying yes or no I am not committing myself I am just giving you a number which is proportional to how much I like the movie. So, it can be interpreted as a probability ok. Uh, now, here is the overall picture right. So, this is the difference between the perceptron function and the sigmoid function. So, notice that here we had this uh, if else condition right which was leading to that sharp boundary. Now, here we do not have that if else condition we just have a function which is a smooth function ok. And here is another picture. So, this is not smooth not continuous and not differentiable. Everyone agrees with that? It is not smooth here right it is not differentiable here. Whereas, this is smooth continuous and differentiable and the contents that we covered today it will be very important to deal with functions which are smooth continuous and differentiable ok. So, for lot of this course calculus is going to be the hero of the course lot of the things that we do will be based on calculus and in calculus always if you have smooth and continuous and differentiable functions they are always good right. So, that is why we want to deal with such functions ok. So, with that we end module uh, 1.